This is Majuba Hill, near the town of Folksrust in South Africa. Today we're going to walk this stunning battlefield. The summit is six and a half thousand feet above sea level. I intend to seize the crest of the Majuba under cover of darkness, and from there mount an attack. On Sunday, February the 27th, 1881, a fierce battle took place here between elements of the British Army and the Boers of the Transvaal. It's an amazing story and one I've been wanting to tell you for a long time. Last month on the Redcoat History Show, I explained the background to the Transvaal Rebellion, also known as the First Anglo-Boer War, and walked the battlefield at Bronkhorst Spreit. You can go back to that episode if you need a bit more background on the causes of this First Boer War, a conflict that's now almost completely forgotten. By February 1881, it was clear that the First Anglo-Boer War had so far been disastrous for the British. Beaten in every major engagement, their commander, General Colley, was desperate for a morale-boosting victory. If you want to know more about him, then please subscribe, as I'll be talking all about him in the next episode, which is going to be released two weeks from now. The battlefield of Majuba is a, about a three-hour drive from Johannesburg, doable as a day trip if you can put aside an entire day. Okay, this is quite exciting. It's the first time I've been here. I'm meeting a tour guide called Sean Friend. The mountain of Majuba dominates the area. General Colley, deciding he needed a big victory, led his men in a night march up this slope on the night of the 26th and 27th of February. His plan entailed occupying the top, which the Boers bizarrely abandoned every night despite having pickets on it during the day. He hoped that the capture of this dominating feature would be enough to force the Boers to withdraw from the neighbouring hill of Lang's Neck. So from the side of Majuba Hill, I'm looking east, and where I'm pointing, that is Lang's Neck. You can see the road snaking through. That was where the Battle of Lang's Neck was that preceded this one. And that is a very strategic point because that is the main invasion route if the British wanted to come back into the Transvaal as it was then. Well, the, the main point that Pichu Bear of the commandos could protect, because if he held this area, he could stop the British from relieving their garrisons in the Transvaal, quite correct. Colley's force was a real mixed bag of nearly 600 men, though not all of them were assigned to the top of the hill. His force comprised two companies of the 58th Regiment of Foot, two companies of the 3rd Battalion 60th Rifles, three companies of the 92nd Highlanders, aka the Gordon Highlanders, and a company-sized detachment of the Naval Brigade, drawn from the crews of HMS Bodicea and HMS Dido. There were also small elements of some other units as well as local black scouts and three journalists. With hindsight, it seems strange that Collie didn't just choose one entire battalion for the operation. As you'll see, this lack of cohesion was to cost the force dearly. So this is where the Boer encampment was down here. It's still a campsite. Uh, all the Boers were camped here with uh, their wagons, horses, horse lines and that sort of thing. We're looking at uh, Majuba. The highest point you can see slightly to the right is a little um, prominence there. Uh, that's the highest point of Maju Majuba, which is McDonald's uh, copy. Slightly to the left and in the foreground, so not on the, not on the skyline, on the foreground is a little, um, a little rise, which is Gordon's Knoll, which played a crucial part in the, in the battle. It's just above that uh, the, the, the cliff face there that perhaps sort you can see. Ridge. The rocky ridge, yeah, just about, it's just a it's little... Almost like a little pimple. Like a little pimple, yeah, you're quite right. But crucial, as we will, uh, as we will find it's out funny, later. from here it looks so inconsequential. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. To climb up the mountain, Sean and I are following the route taken by one of the groups of Boer soldiers tasked with retaking the position. It's a hard climb. We've got a lot of greenery here now, a lot of trees, a lot of bushes, but Sean was telling me none of this would have been here at the time. These are all modern day imports. At 3.40 a.m. Collie climbed up here and quickly allocated the men to their positions, but in the dark some units became separated and later rivals were simply sent to wherever there were gaps in the perimeter, often alongside men from different units that they didn't know or trust. Nothing short of hunger could turn us off the Majuba mountain. As the sun rose, General Colley commented, we could stay here forever. 
and looking down the hill now you can see why he was so confident. Surely no one could advance up these steep slopes under fire, could they? So confident were the men that they shouted to the surprised Boers below and shook their fists triumphantly. But the British didn't know the ground well and they weren't aware that gullies and dead ground would allow the Boer attackers to get very close to the top of the hill in relative safety. About 450 Boers under the command of General Pete Joubert quickly organised themselves and began to move up the slopes. So we're just coming out of the dead ground. We're just emerging from cover. And only now are we starting to get into view of where the British defenders would have been. Yeah, so now you can clearly see that little pimple that you called, that you referred to earlier. It's now from here anyway, it's the highest part of the mountain. That's where the 92nd Gordon Highlanders were. And this is where the, the Boers they had to come up here. Now they had to cross this 100, 150 meters in open, open ground. Now they were in danger. So what they did was retreated back. The old guys fired into onto the skyline to keep the British heads down. And in small groups, five, ten, they would run across this open, dangerous ground and take up a position directly underneath the cliffs and they're back in safety again. Surprisingly, the British troops were not ordered to build any defences. In hindsight, that does seem a bizarre oversight. Some units, though, did use their initiative and began piling stones to make makeshift breastworks or sangers. If there's any pastime better than hiking on battlefields, I don't know what it is. Actually, I do know one thing. As the fighting intensified, Collie seemed to totally lose control of the situation. When Lieutenant Ian Hamilton ran over this exposed neck multiple times requesting reinforcements for the northern tip of the peninsula, Collie begrudgingly gave him just six more men, refusing to believe how serious the situation was becoming. So Hamilton was having to run across here, oh, to go running up past where Sean is, over the top, to where Collie and the headquarters element were. Over to uh, my left in the front there is Gordon's Knoll. Now you can see we are now on the eastern side of Gordon's Knoll so the Boers when they got to this position could fire into the right hand side of the British which is called enfilading fire. They massed here, the Boers massed in this area and launched a furious attack on Gordon's Knoll um, killing pretty much everybody that was on that knoll. Two survived who ran back with Lieutenant Hamilton back up the top of the hill and the Boers then surged up here and took that position, Gordon's Knoll. And from Gordon's Knoll they were now probably 40 to 50 meters perhaps from the actual British line which is on the top of the hill which is where we're going to get to now. Yeah you can really see that dead ground from here. Once the Boers were under there there's no way you could get them. On the right hand side now you can see McDonald's copy which I mentioned right at the beginning. That is the highest point. But from here to the British line is probably 60 meters or so. This was from here. The, from here the Boers then were in a position they consolidated and all three of the, um, of the attacking forces uh, we're closing in for the final assault, closing in for the kill. The reserves which Collie had been holding back were now ordered to reinforce the threatened northern perimeter. But the men were confused and shaken. They needed cohesion and strong leadership and they had neither. The British regiments, one of the main reasons why they were defeated apart from the topography, was that command and control was lost. You had the 92nd Highlanders who had um, a khaki top and a kilt, greenish kilt. You had the naval brigade who had blue uniforms. You had the 58th regiment who had red uniforms. And you had the King's Royal Rifles who had a dark green uniform. But on the assault up the mountain, all these different units got intermingled. And so their officers were mixed up. And, you know, in, in the army, um, in any attacking force, you need 
command and control. You need somebody that can take charge and give you orders because the ordinary troops are not capable of acting on their own. They need to listen to orders. And with that command and control having broken down, uh, it was pretty much chaos towards the end, particularly where uh, there were desertions, British troops were in ones and twos running back towards where they had come from. And so the line faltered and eventually with the Boers attacking over the front, uh, and they just poured through and chased the British off down off the back to Sailor's Knoll and then down uh, back to their camp. The Boers had adapted the classic horns of the buffalo formation so beloved of the Zulu Impis and they had begun to work around Collie's flanks. Soon a general panic set in amongst the British. Small groups of demoralised men began to break off and make a dash for the rear, their own officers being forced to threaten to shoot them. But despite the disaster unfolding in classic British style, there was still time for a Victoria Cross to be won. Lance Corporal Farmer of the Army Hospital Corps, standing over the badly wounded Surgeon Landon, was shot in each arm, but continued to wave his bandages to indicate to the Boers that they were shooting at wounded men. It was a brave deed that undoubtedly saved a number of lives. In the confusion, Collie himself was killed. If you want to learn more about Collie and hear more about his death, then make sure to watch the next episode in two weeks' time, where Professor John Laband tells me all about this fascinating British officer. We're just behind the British line now, um, and General Collie, who was the overall commander of British forces, uh, was killed in this spot here. This marks where he fell. His body was taken back, uh, and he's buried where the British camp was, Mount Prospect, which is probably about 10 miles or so from here. He's, the British camp is now a cemetery, a military cemetery, and he is uh, buried there. But this is where he was killed. Uh, there is quite a lot of um, argument, perhaps, as to who killed General Colley. Um, and it's one of those things we would rather just leave it for uh, another conversation. But the Boers obviously uh, all claim to have killed him. But uh, yeah, he was killed together with, the numbers vary, but probably 93 British soldiers were died on the mountain out of 400 that eventually got to the top. Another brave man was Lieutenant Hector MacDonald of the 92nd. He led about 20 men in a determined last stand, believing that he could rally the rest of the force. It's said that as the Boers closed in, he set about them with his fists before eventually being overpowered and captured. As an aside, MacDonald had joined the army as a private and had risen through the ranks, eventually becoming a major general. He was a true warrior, but tragically took his own life in 1903, following a scandal in Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka. So I'm stood in what was called the Depression. As you can see, it's surrounded by, by these knolls and these ridges. And this was where uh, the headquarters element was. And I think somewhere over here was where the first aid post was. And right behind me now is where there's a small British cemetery. And inside, there's 93 names commemorated of those who were killed. Collie himself, of course, was killed, but he was buried elsewhere. This one I'm looking at now says, RIP in memory of 33 NCOs and men of the Gordon Highlanders, killed in action February the 27th, 1881. As I pan over to the left, there's a stone here. I'm struggling to read it. Erected by the officers, non-commissioned officers and men of the 58th Regiment. So similar to the, the other older stone behind me. And here's a list of names. Included are Privates Addington, Richardson, Smith, Stone, and many others. And so the battle was lost. The British streamed away to escape. Their commander dead and their hopes for a swift end to the war dashed. Shortly after the end of the battle, Sir Evelyn Wood, hero of the Zulu War, was forced by London to sue for peace. The British Army, the soldiers in South Africa were livid, feeling they now had enough men to win the war once and for all. But it would be nearly 20 years before they would get their chance to avenge this stinging defeat. <laughs>